We are going to talk a bit about how we can use multi-axis tool paths for 3D challenges. So really what that means is using some of the technology in the multi-axis package in MasterCam to solve certain programming issues customers have reached out to us over the years for. And this has been a pretty highly requested webinar and we've actually worked a little bit with corporate too on how some of these tips and tricks basically work with the package in conjunction with you know just a three axis machine. Uh, we will get a little bit into towards the end um, on how you can use some of these on if you do have multi-axis equipment but uh, I'll be passing that over to Josh and we actually get into the files here. But we'll, we'll be talking about the some of the advantages that these tool paths have, what the workflow is like, because a lot of people will initially get intimidated by the multi-axis tool paths and think, you know, that, oh, there's so many settings. When I try to create a tool path, it just says, you know, unable to calculate tool path, what do I do? Well, Josh will get a little bit into that on, you know, how you can get what we call a cut pattern and then basically go back and start fine tuning all the other control that those tool paths have. We'll be going a little bit over uh, fillets, edge breaks, undercuts, which are kind of common, you know, 3D programming challenges if you're in the mold industry or really any other sort of uh, parts that require those types of cuts. Josh will also then be talking about how we can use the five axis drill command in MasterCam to do a couple of things for, you know, A, automating different drilling routines similar to the feature-based drilling, but he'll talk a little bit of how there's some differences there and how it can be a little smarter than the feature-based drilling. And then at the end, like I said before, we'll talk a little bit about the tilt to avoid gouge, where if you have a three-axis part where you're, you know, maybe don't have enough holder clearance to get down there and you do have a five-axis capable machine, it's possible in a lot of the 3D high-speed tool paths. So I also want to go a little bit over on how the MasterCam mill, what I call road roadmap works, because there's a bunch of new options MasterCam added actually with X9 on how you can configure a multi-axis package with MasterCam. So if you have MasterCam mill standard, which is the old mill level one, you know, mill level one went away, all the mill one customers are now at mill two under the old naming structure but you can add two of the multi-axis packages to that base mill level and one is curve and drill five axis so that's curve is basically a free form contour five axis tool path with five four or three axis output and then the drill five axis is the same way you can do five four or three axis output the swarf is a true five axis tool path but we had a lot of requests a couple years ago for customers just wanting to add that, pa that path to their package, so it is available. And then if you have a MasterCam Mill 3D suite, that's where you can start adding the full multi-axis package, where you get basically access to all the multi-axis tool paths, except for two, and that's the Port Expert and Blade Expert, and those are you know highly specialized tool paths for either porting or turbine blade, turbo blade sort of cutting. And I just have MasterCam Mill 5X there. That's just if a customer right away goes to the, you know, the full-blown mill package, which basically includes all of the options you can see on this page. And I have a note on here because, you know, we're talking a lot about solving three-axis challenges with multi-axis software. You don't need any custom post work if you're just running a three or even a four-axis machine with all these tool paths. Um, four-axis Machines are handled on kind of a case-by-case -case basis, so we'd have to talk to you about it. But if you do have a full five-axis machine, you'd have to contact us for a quote on a post-processor to run that machine. Either in, we, And we have two levels to those machines. You can either do three plus two output, or you can do simultaneous five-axis output. And a lot of the five-axis posts also have an option for machine simulation, as long as the customer can provide the 3D models of the machine, which you can get from your machine tool vendor. So I just want to talk, lastly, before we hand it over to Josh here, what are the multi-axis tool paths that have three-axis output capability? So on the left-hand side here, 
Mastercam redesigned the multi-axis window a bit, and you'll see it when Josh gets in there on how the different tool paths are structured and what they're named and things like that. But there's a pattern page and an application page. So curve, drill, morph. Morph is like a blend tool path if you're familiar in the 3D tool path world. Parallel is similar to the 3D high speed raster tool path. Along curve, triangular mesh is basically kind of a catch all for all 3D style tool paths. So like scallop and waterline and things like that are all under the triangular mesh option in the multi-axis tool paths. And then under the application page, only project curve and circle mill are on there because I think that's the page, right, Josh, where like port expert and blade expert and stuff are on there. And then I also have a note here, all multi-axis tool paths support undercuts. There's only a few of the 3D tool paths, two of them actually, that support undercuts and that are... Old school contour flow Okay, which is the, you know, quote unquote old school contour and flow line. So right now, you know, a lot of the 3D high speed tool paths don't support undercuts. So with all that being said, I don't see any questions here. I am going to pass my screen sharing over to Josh and we'll get started with the more technical portion of this presentation. There we go. Okay, it looks like I'm up and running here. Um, so I just want to start this off by saying that I'm going to go over some of the basics of it first and we're going to accelerate to some of the more difficult tasks. Uh, I just have a couple basic designs here. I'm going to show you the difference between like a morph tool path and then the parallel tool path, also known as the raster. The morph is also like a newer version of surface finish blend for those who have used it. Um, so I'm going to apply the tool path in two different situations to show how it can be used. Um, these right here are just some basic flat tool paths, flat models here that I created just to show you what they can be uh, used for. Um, not all tool paths we apply are going to be based on a free flow or a nice easy design, which is in the machining world is you know less common more and more here. Um, so first off, we go to the multi-axis section up on the top here. And these are the pattern and the applications that, that Matt was uh, specifically directing to. Uh, pattern means it can be applied to anything. An application means it is an application based. Okay. So for the tool paths that I'm going to be using today, I'm just going to use the morph and the parallel. Now the morph tool path, uh, for those that are familiar with the surface finish blend, requires geometry to morph one tool path to the next here. Let me get my computer a second here. There we go. It shows up just like your standard 3D tool path. It's come in, you have your tool, your holder. I'm just going to do a basic quarter inch flat end mill just to show you the basics here. Just like any other 3D tool path, the only thing that really changes between the tools is this cut pattern page. Okay, Same thing in the 3D world. So here we have a couple options for the morph. We have patterns from and to, meaning blending one side of an edge to the other and we can use curves or surfaces. In my example here, I'm just going to use the curves. So pattern from is where you're going to start the tool path on. So let me go ahead and click this button right here. It's going to bring up our chaining manager. I don't have any wireframe uh, because I like to drive as much off the solids as possible. And these are flat solids here. So I'm going to go to the solid model right here. And I'm going to say a single edge because I want to start the blending of the tool path along this side right here. Right there. And I'm going to click OK. Now pattern two, where do I want to blend the tool path to the other side? Again, right here, single edge. Now in this my case, I'm doing single edges, but you can do a closed loop to closed loop. Uh, the one stipulation on morph is you cannot do points. It can only go down to a 5,000 diameter circle. Okay here. Same thing applies. Drive surfaces is the same thing as it would be in the 3D world. These are surfaces that you want to cut or apply the tool path to. I'm going to click OK here. And then I'm just going to select the top surface right on the top here. 
So that's a toolpath we want to apply the surface to. <clears throat> now we do have a lot of different options here. Uh, one of the options that I do want to go over is the area type because MasterCam can apply the toolpath several different ways. The two differences right here that I'll go over is full avoid cuts at exact surface edges, meaning you see the picture right here, it will not apply a toolpath to the exact surface edge, meaning that you have a bad surface edge, it's broken, has a gap, or you want to leave a little space for blending onto another area. And the second one here is an exact surface edges, which means it's actually going to put the center of the tool on the edge of the surface. Again, it's for blending purposes. For our purpose here, I'm going to do exact, uh, avoid exact surface edges. Down here to the right is going to be our X and Y step over. Uh, it is maximum, so it is a uh, maximum amount. If it sees that it can't do an exact number, it'll master cam use its algorithm and kind of step it off. So it may be a little bit less than what you have. This way you don't have like a skim cut at the end. I'm going to open this up just a little bit for processing for our a demonstration here. Uh, now typically uh, when we're in the multi-axis world, uh, I would be clicking OK here, or the green check to see the tool path. I then dividing the, the tool axis control, but since this is a three axis demo here, I already know that we're going to go to three axis here, the tool axis control, and deviate down to three axis. I'm going to go ahead and click the OK button right here. And it's literally going to be a blended tool path, blending from the straight line, and you can see that we slowly arc our way over to the blended edge. Okay. This is a free-form tool path. It works great from going from an odd surface edge to an odd surface edge, or a raster tool path, or a parallel tool path, which I'll be showing next here, would kind of fall on its face because you would have a lot of pickups or anything like that. Um, the only other tool path that would do this type of situation, again, is the 3D surface finish blend. Uh, the one reason I do like this tool path a lot is the 3D surface blend is an older style tool path, or a legacy as we call it. Uh, and it is not multi-core processed, uh, the morph toolpath is. So those guys that like that toolpath, you can now move on with your day instead of waiting for your PC to regenerate because of the uh, old style of legacy. Now I'm going to move over to the uh, raster or the parallel toolpath. It's going to be set up in some way. I just want to show you how it can be operated on and how it can be used in a similar fashion and how it's a very literal toolpath. Go down to the galley here, and I'm again going to go to the parallel toolpath. <clears throat> give a second to pop up here. I got quite a few master cam sessions on my uh, PC open here, so just give it a second. Same tool here. Now the cut pattern again is the only thing that can really change between a toolpath, but the parallel toolpath can be driven uh, several different ways. First off, you can drive it versus a curved edge, which is what I'm going to do in this particular one. You have a surface, and then you also have an angle. So not only can you treat this toolpath in X and Y, you can also treat it in Z. So you can also use this toolpath as a waterline toolpath and do a constant Z here. If I go ahead and click constant Z, you can see it's zero degrees, so it's perpendicular to the Z axis or parallel to the Z axis here, and it's going to cut straight down. I will apply this in one of the later tool paths, but it has a couple different options. Curve here is if you don't know what angle uh, that you want to stay uh, parallel to, um, you can actually select it. So in this case, I'm going to go long ways. I'm going to go ahead and select icon right here, and I'm single edge. And I'm going to show you long ways, and I'm also going to show you width ways to show how it will operate. So long ways here, it's a very literal toolpath, so it'll constantly do the toolpath up and down. I'm going to go ahead and change my step over here to 125 for a little bit quicker regeneration. And again, we're in the three-axis world, so I'm just going to change this down to a three-axis output. And I need to select my drive services here. There we go. And okay. So you can see here it's a very, very literal tool path. So when it sees that it hits the edge, it has to do a retract, pick up, and go back down. And it'll continue to go back and forth. But it's very, very literal. So once it reaches the edge, it'll pick up, come back. So in this case, for this type of surface, this would not be the best case. So there's always different ways to change it. So one way that I do like to change it, if I were to do something like this, I can grab <clears throat> my parameters again here. 
And instead of doing the long curve, I can exit out and come back in here, rechain all, and I can go long ways. Okay, so it's a back and forth tool path. Click OK and regenerate one more time. So you can see that it goes left and right in very literal fashion here. Um, I'll, I do, a lot of times I'll do this tool path instead of uh, the peel tool path. Those that like to do the peel that don't want to try to do the dynamic motion. I just want to have a back and forth tool path to get out a centered section. Uh, this would be another option for it. Um, does anyone have any questions on these particular basics before I move on to any type of an advanced situation on these? Okay, we don't see any tool, uh, questions here, so I'm going to go ahead and move to the next file. A little bit more of an advanced file. It's actually got a 3D shape here. Um, I do have the surface finish blend toolpath already applied to it because I'm going to show you a difference here. Um, I like using the surface finish blend because I can actually go back and forth and actually blend down a filleted edge instead of trying to use waterline. Uh, or trying to use the pencil tool path. Now the downfall to this tool path here, if I actually go to a top view, if we blend from edge to edge, it's literally edge to edge. However, if that edge of the fillet needs to travel more down in Z, uh, in the surface finish blend, we would have to create geometry, offset it, and then be able to go actually all the way down the fillet. One other reason that I like the morph tool path is because we don't have to do that. It will go to the contact edge. It doesn't go to where the tool tip is only on the edge that you had selected. So I'm going to go ahead and hide this tool path and I'm going to apply the morph tool path in this situation. I'm going to go to multi-axis and I'm going to go to the morph section right here. pop up. All right, I'm just going to grab this quarter inch ball end mill here. Cut, print, uh, cut pattern. Again, the same thing applies. Where do you want to start and where do you want to go to? I'm going to go ahead and use curves again. Now I want to start at the top of this fillet and move our way down. So I'm going to go ahead and swap the solid model here. I'm going to go ahead and do the loop and I'm going to select this edge right here and it goes all the way around. Now, like surface finish blend here, I start right here and my arrow is going this way. So when you do a blended object, whether you're using surface finish blend or morph, make sure they start in roughly the same spot and the arrows are going the same direction. Click OK here. Pattern to geometry. This is where I'm going to blend to. Now, I also want to point this out here because a lot of people don't know about this function. It's the linked edges and they get, uh, you know, questions on why it's not actually grabbing the first way uh, like I just did on the surface edge. Linked edges means that you're selecting surface edges that belong to multiple faces, okay? Which means that I have to span it over different faces on a solid model or surface model, okay? For this one, you have to literally walk it around and do what you want with it. So I need to start right here. It's not going to be belonging to that face right there. Oops. And there you go, surface edge here. I did a loop here. That's my fault here. Linked edges right here. And you literally walk it around the edge. Now, in 2018, those of you who tried to do the beta testing, this has been improved and made it so you can dr actually drive it with the keyboard, make it a little bit quicker. Uh, in 2017, we do have to click through. Go ahead and click OK here. Drive services, what do I want to cut? Again, I'm going to select right here, and then I'm going to do faces. Uh, as an extra piece right here, I'm going to do select by solids, or by colors here. And I'm going to select the green surfaces just to make my life a little easier. And click OK. Now again, we're in a three-axis world, so I'm just going to go ahead and change this to a three-axis output. Now you can see the toolpath actually walked all the way down, and the toolpath is a little further down. That's because when you watch this, it actually goes down to the tangency or edge of the tool path. So we'll go all the way down here. Let's go up here. You can see that it is the tangent edge of the radius to the flute going all the way down to make sure it cuts completely all the way, uh, completely down versus just to the center of the tool tip as the surface finished blend would. Uh, I'm going to stop real quick here because that's the end of that one. Uh, we do have a question here. 
can use a corner radius cutter to do the path even with the curved face. Um, I, I, John, are you uh, referring to either a radius tool or are you referring to like a bull nose or a flat? Yes. So if you do a morphed toolpath, I'll get into actually when we get to one of the radiuses later, I can do a morphed toolpath and set it to uh, determine by number cuts one and it'll center the tool. And then you can use a radius tool to walk around the edge as long as it's achievable. Uh, you know, not going into a tight 90 degree corner that that tool can actually reach it. Uh, any other questions before I move on? Uh, I'm also going to apply another toolpath to this section here. Okay, the tool path start a different place, different corner. Do we have control from uh, Jacob here? Uh, yes. Um, we do have an option. I'm just going to briefly touch on it because you do have control. A couple different ways. You do have control via like the old school way, which is, you know, determine start points or change start point when you're inside the geometry. Uh, the second location that you can do is inside cut pattern. And then you have a start point option right here. With start point, It'll add an extra section right here, start point parameters, and then you can dictate the actual start point on the tool path. Go ahead and exit out of that. Any other questions real quick before I apply a different style tool path to this model here? I'm going to go ahead and move forward here real quick. Now this next section here is I'm going to apply a tool path to the rest of the model here. I'm actually going to use the parallel tool path. Parallel tool path here. Again, with the parallel tool path, I can control it via Z-depth, which is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to mimic an advanced waterline tool path. So inside of cut parameters, we're going to do by curve. I'm going to stay parallel to a curve. And I'm going to do this curved edge again here. There we go. I'm going to open up my step over here real quick just for processing. Let's actually do 75 so you can actually see it here. And again, I'm going to go do a three-axis tool path. But angle, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm actually going to keep it on the curve to show you here. I'm going to click OK. Oop. And I need my drive surfaces again here. Check. And we're going to do this color right here. Select it all. OK. So a couple different things here. I'm going to go to a front view. And I'm actually going to show you the model here. So it's literally a three-axis step down staying parallel to this edge that we have. Okay? From a side view, this looks great as it would in a waterline tool path. However, if we go to our top view, it has the same faults, not as bad as a waterline would do. You can see you have a couple tool paths on here. However, it's not exactly what we would look for. Um, there is an option that uh, a lot of people aren't aware of that actually corrects a lot of this action. Uh, if we go inside the parameters again, um, it is a hidden option or a drop-down option, I should say, called adaptive cuts. Now, adaptive cuts actually goes through and does what would be add cuts inside of waterline, but it will also apply it on a flat surface. So underneath the cut pattern here, advanced options for surface quality. Just turning on adaptive cuts. Okay? Now, adaptive cuts does add a little bit of processing time because it has to figure out an extra algorithm with it. However, it can actually apply additional cuts to correct certain areas and to even out the path. Like I said, it takes a couple extra seconds here to process. Now you can just see here the tool path that applied. We had one path on here, but now we have multiples, and it almost turns it into like a scallop type look. And even when the bowl opened up down here where the water line would start to fall out, with the adaptive cuts with the parallel, it actually adds the additional cuts inside of there to give you more even surface finish.
Uh, anyone have any questions on the adaptive cuts feature? No? Okay. All right, we'll move on to the uh, next section here. Everybody's. Hey, just let everyone know, we kind of just opened up a poll to you. Uh, we are just seeing what kind of version you guys are running on, uh, just to see what everyone's using and if you have any questions or anything like that. All right, while well, the poll's going on here, I'm just kind of preview my part here. They, they see this. Oh, oh, I apologize. I'm going to wait for the poll to end here. All right, we just close out of that poll here. Uh, so I'm going to open up my open up my part. I'm just on a right-hand view here. Um, this is just a basic one. It even has just a very minor undercut right here, where this would be a problem for a lot of 3D machinists to try to get into. I did apply a basic raster toolpath with a ball end mill. One of the problems as well with the uh, like the raster toolpath, the raster toolpath actually does not fully support a lollipop. It turns a lollipop into a ball end mill, so I have it programmed inside a ball end mill here. As you can see, it doesn't actually undercut the section. It will come up and over. Okay, So now I'm going to apply a toolpath here uh, that I'm going to use is the parallel again, and I'm going to show you how it works and an extra feature that will allow you to do an undercut here. So from the top view, I'm going to go ahead and turn off this toolpath, and I'm going to go to the parallel toolpath. <clears throat> Opening up on my PC here. All I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use the parallel angle, and we're going to use a lollipop. So just to kind of show you what kind of lollipop I have in here, I just have a basic half-inch style lollipop that you may see inside of a shop. I didn't develop the hold or anything for this particular scenario because we wouldn't actually need it. Cut pattern here. I'm going to do an angle. Just to show you, it does actually show you the different angles here. So 90 degrees in Ys would be a long Y. 90 degrees would be a long X. So I'm going to keep it at zero here. Uh, we could also do a curved surface if we wanted. I'm going to go ahead and open up our step over here. And tool axis control, I'm going to do three axis. So first thing first is I'm just going to go ahead and drop this tool path and show you what it does initially. And we're going to go back to drive surfaces. Colors and green. All right. So just a couple ones. First off, when you actually view it with the initial cut, you can see the toolpath comes up and grabs it, okay? Let me actually go to a proper right-hand view here. It'll actually undercut and drive on different points of the ball to make sure it actually grabs the toolpath and drives it correctly, okay, for both cuts here. Now, there's one thing that usually hangs up a couple people in this scenario. Uh, you know, maybe my ball cutter doesn't actually have enough girth to grab it. Uh, the undercut's a little bit more severe, and my tool actually doesn't uh, undercut like it's supposed to. One option that a lot of people aren't aware of that can actually correct an undercut tool path in the three-axis or in the multi-axis world is an option inside of the tool control page. Once it comes up here, Sorry, the collision control page. Right here is one option here. You're actually checking against the surface, but the actual option that you're looking for is underneath the advanced parameters and the extend tool to infinity. Okay, The extend tool to infinity option actually takes the girth of the tool and the cutting parameters, which is the half-inch ball end mill, and extends it straight up. So it would not allow it to undercut. If you ever run into an issue where it would not undercut, Deselect tool under infinity, and it'll actually project it 
as if it was not extended, meaning you're allowed to do undercuts, get into smaller areas. That is a default that is on by Mastercam, and it's there because probably about 90% of the scenarios you don't want it on, or sorry, you do want it on, but in something like this in the 3X's world, we don't want it on. And it'll actually allow it to undercut fully all the way to the edge. And you can see it actually grabs it all the way to the edge here versus sticking out just a little bit as we had in the previous path. You go back and forth. We're good? Okay. All right. Um, I don't think we have any particular questions about this scenario here. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next section. Do you want to do them? I only got... We're going we're gonna to put up another poll here. Have you tried the Mastercam beta? Yeah, have you tried the Mastercam 2018 beta, which I believe we're on five right now? It's the final beta, right? All right, thank you everyone for uh, participating in the poll here. I have another file up, which is a very, very common issue that we had. This part was actually sent in by a customer that we helped, but we've seen it so often that we figured we'd do a webinar on uh, one of these undercuts here. What it is, if you drill holes and you have a cross drill where you create a burr, um, how do I go about getting a clean tool path to go in there and clean up that burr? First thing to note is you have to create a filleted edge, okay? So inside of here, we actually did like a 5 thou corner break around there, and we're going to use a morph tool path. The reason we're going to use a morph tool path uh, is because I can dictate where on the side I want to go. In this case, I want to be on the center, so it's going to be determined by cuts. So I'm going to go ahead and open our morph tool path. Again, in this scenario, we'd want to use a lollipop cutter, which I already have one designed inside the system, so you can actually get inside of there. Again, it's a standard half-inch lollipop cutter that I created. Pattern surface, to and from. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this outer edge right here. Okay. Again, paying attention to where the arrow is. Again, pointing that direction. And I'm going to grab the pattern to geometry right here. Again, similar start point, same direction arrow. Okay. Drive surfaces, where do I want to cut? In this case, I just want to pay attention to just that lip. Now, I went over a couple other options. The one option I do like and I do use a lot is determined by number of cuts. Okay. Now, if you do determine number of cuts with a morph tool path, it'll put the single cut dead center of where the lines are. If you do determine by number of cuts, with a parallel tool path, it'll put it just by the curve geometry that you have selected. So in this case, determine number of cuts one, because we just want to break the edge. Okay. Go ahead and do this in a three-axis motion. Okay. Now you can see that it did not apply a tool path. Okay. This is intentional because if you actually go inside the parameters, the tool collision page that we had applied automatically is defaulted to trim against the surfaces. So it's seen that the tool path is trimming out the collision to the drive surface. So it's colliding against the drive surface as it comes in, which is causing the tool path to not appear. We don't actually want to trim against the drive surfaces. We're actually going to use a technique to help alleviate the lead in and to apply the tool path. So what we're actually going to do here is we're going to say retract the tool along the tool axis not when it see, hits the drive surfaces, but when it uh, be, uh, sees the check surface. The check surface is going to be the bore. So you're aware of the bore now, just like in the 3D world. 
Mastcam is only aware of what you inform it. We did not inform the bore was there, so all that seen that it was colliding against the drive surface. We'll click OK. Okay. And green check here, and we're going to go ahead and regenerate. Now you can see that I have a lead in going in and out. Okay. Now again, we do have an issue here because it's trying to stay away from the product. Okay. Now, there's multiple different ways to do it. I'm just going to pop up our other file here just so I can show you a, uh, a different one. Just so we can kind of keep going here because I want to make sure we go over on our webinar. So this is what it is in a finished product. Okay, so I'm going to go inside the tool path here. Second to open. Again here, it's the same parameters I had just to show you. Determine number of cuts, tool axis, three axis. And I have, again, the check surfaces, but I have additional check surfaces in hide side of here to show. Okay? It's the same bore. <clears throat> and then we have right here, I have that same button that we had before, extend tool to infinity off. Okay? This is the same one that was causing an issue with the undercut. And again, in this situation, we'd want extend tool to infinity to be off because that is causing the tool path to be removed because it's seeing that it's actually grabbing the tool. So again, it'll come in, it'll seize the bore, comes down, actually leads in. I'm going to go to a uh, right side view here. Actually, let's go to a left side view, 180. So you can see that it actually comes around the bore. Let's get a good view here. Comes around the bore and use the top, top of the ball to edge break, side of the ball, and the bottom of the ball, okay? Uses the, the edge break all the way around. Once it sees it's done, it pulls out along the tool axis, and it comes straight up. Now, again, this is two scenarios where the uh, extend tool to infinity would cause an issue um, just because of how it's dictated. But, again, these are only in three-axis circumstances that you'd want them to be utilized in. Any questions on an undercut or break? I answered that one. Okay, I didn't even see what you got up there. Um, okay. Wait a second here. I don't think we have any other questions here. Excuse me. I'm going to go ahead and move on to our five-axis drill. Uh, like Matt mentioned, uh, this is, I would say, like an upgrade to the FBM drill. Uh, it's much smarter and much more friendlier to use, I believe. Um, and you can control it a little bit better, and it's actually stock aware, which is why I'm actually going to be demonstrating this. Just to show you, you have a couple different scenarios here. I've got a whole bunch of quarter-inch holes here, and I've got a whole bunch of half-inch holes here. If I go to a right-side view, and I go through my part here, you can see that the quarter-inch holes are at random heights. Okay, just to show that they can be aware of it. I'm going to use a flat uh, end mill just to show you to the depths here. However, you can use tip control and tip comp just like you can in the other drilling tool paths. So drill right here. This is going to be the multi-axis drill. I'm going to select our flat end mill here. Cut pattern, just so everyone is aware. Standard drilling cycles like you can inside the uh, 2D world. But the selection type, there's one feature here that's brand new to 2017 and is only available inside the multi-axis drill one, which is by feature. By features actually allows you to select the bore instead of having to draw geometry. Now, I do have geometry on here from when I created the model, but it's not going to be used. Okay, So I can do a control click here to match all diameters. So I'm just going here. I'm going to select this wall just to show I'm selecting the wall. Hit control. And then it selected all of them. Now you do get a preview of a line and a point and a circle. It almost does like whole axis in the background so you don't have to do this operation twice. I'm going to hit enter here. We get our standard sort operation. Obviously I selected by mass so I did not uh, sort them myself. But standard sorting uh, works here. With those features, inside of tool axis here, it doesn't need any type of tool axis control. Like Matt said, this can be done in 3, 4, or 5 axis output. Our scenario here is going to be 3 axis. 
<clears throat> collision control. It's not shown directly. I just want to touch on this page. I did mention it does have tip comp. This is where it is. It's not actually a page called tip comp like it is in the 2D drill. Linking parameters. Now this is again a little bit different because you don't have absolute values in the multi-axis world. There's only incrementals. Um, so I usually use line hole length, meaning it's going to find the top of the bore and the bottom of the bore of the drilled hole, and it's going to use that as a length. If you need to go deeper, you'd use a negative number, and if you need to go more shallow, use a positive number. Okay. Again, feed is going to be driven by the top of the hole. I'm going to go ahead and just use start and end and operation only, and I'm going to go ahead and click the green check here. Now you can show that we have the holes here. I'm going to go ahead and put this model as a see-through. And you can see by the blue lines here that it actually grabbed their proper depth on all of them. Instead of having to do each hole individually like you would have to do in the 2D world. Because in the 2D world, even if you did incremental select each one from bottom, when your top is stock, you'd also have to make sure you pay attention to that as well. But this selection is a little easier, a little bit quicker, and it has actually been off your, done off your model instead of having to do whole axis. The other nice feature of the five axis is it's actually stock aware. Okay, So I actually have a random drawn stock here. If you look at it, it just has some variable depth here a hole that doesn't actually have any stock and it would go all the way through. Now in this situation it would be very hard to dictate uh, what stock is to leave, how far do I drill to make sure it drills through. So in this scenario I would actually create a stock model. Uh, most of the, the multi-axis tool baths are stock aware. So I'm actually going to create a stock model here. I'm going to call it stock. And we're going to actually reference a model on the screen, which is this guy right here. Okay. And OK. I'm going to turn off my model in the background. You can see that it still appears here. Those that aren't familiar with stock models, it actually is a tool path off the left-hand side that I can turn on and off. OK? So it actually is aware, and it's turnable on, turn on and turn off. I'm going to go ahead and do the drill tool path again here. We're going to use a flat end mill this time. I do have a stock model here, so I'm going to use stock, and we're going to use stock model. Now, if you had multiple stock models, you'd be able to drop down and select which ones you're trying to refer to. I only have one, so I only have one option. Now, you have options for using the stock definition. You can say, hey, be aware of the stock only for the feed to make sure you don't wrap it into the model. The depth to make sure the depth is correct, or both. Uh, in my uh, position here, I only need depth, or both would work. Cut pattern, again, I'm going to use the features. Select on features here. Again, I'm going to select these half-inch holes. I'm going to use the control right here to control click on the matching diameters. There we are. Hit enter. And again, I can sort it if I like. Tool axis control is going to be three axes here. Collision control, if I had tip, I could do it. And then down into linking parameters. This is where I'm going to do an extra depth here. I'm just going to say go an extra half inch deep just to kind of show you what it does. I'm going to go ahead and click OK here. Now if I go to a right side view here and I'm going to turn on the stock model so you can see it. Oops, let's go to a left hand side view or a front view. Apologize. There we go. And you can see it's half inch deep from the stock. Now you can see this hole was intentional. It's slightly lower than this one because the, the stock slightly touches that hole. Okay, so you can see that it is aware. It's not if it's completely covered, even if it's partially touching, that it'll actually recognize it. One of the reasons I do like this because if you have variable depth, or let's just say you have uh, a part that's in your A axis, or even in your lathe that you already center drilled or bored through, and you don't want to drill all the way through, or you only just want to drill to the stock, you can use this and be very intelligent that way. Any questions on using the stock or the five axis model here? All right. Uh, I'm down to the last file. Do you want the last one or no? No, no, we're good. Okay. Okay, just want to make sure here. 
So I just took a uh, basic training part here. This is called the tilt to avoid gouge. Um, this one does require uh, the full-blown multi-axis package, and it does require a five-axis post. Okay. Um, and machine. Yes, correct. This is not three plus two. This is a, a stepping stone or the baby step into the five axis world. If you don't know how to understand how to deal with tilting axes, you just know how to apply it in the three axis world, but you need it done in five. So I'm actually going to take a 3D toolpath in this one. I'm going to take our waterline toolpath. Our waterline toolpath here. And I'm going to head and select those drive surfaces. I'm going to select everything. So everyone knows that how a waterline toolpath is, is a direct Z step down, will not do flats, and is a more of a basic toolpath. So I will show here the tool. I'm going to grab a ball end mill. And I did design a holder for this one, what we'd use in the five axis world. It's a kind of in a smaller holder, and I have it choked up to three quarters of an inch, just because we'd want to choke up a tool as much as possible. Now, if you have the five axis options here, you actually have collision checking. Most of you are probably aware of trim to avoid gouge. This will actually trim away the tool path if it hits the holder. That's not necessarily what you want. If you have a five axis machine, you actually have a tilt to avoid gouge. A tilt to avoid gouge will slowly tilt the tool to make sure it does not hit the holder up until that you're uh, up until the angle that you're allowing it, which is your max angle here. Okay, max angle is what you're allowing your machine to tilt. So maybe I don't want the machine to go to a full 90 to the surface because maybe my head may hit the table, may hit my fixture or anything like that, or I may have another part near it. So in my case, I'm going to do 75 degrees. Now this is a max tilt angle. If Mastercam sees that it doesn't actually need to achieve 75 degrees to reach it, it's only going to use what it needs to uh, get the cut done. You have shank clearance, which is actually clearance down here if you need to make sure. And then you have a holder clearance, which is holder around here, okay? As long as you have the holder pretty well defined, it'll be accurate for what you need. And I usually do a clearance on the bottom just to make sure, you know, my tool setter wasn't quite correct or it's not perfect on 750. Give myself a little bit of wiggle room here. That's the actual only feature that you need in here. The rest of the tool path stays just the same. So we're going to go through here. We're going to go ahead and just say zero to leave on stock and floors, which is what we would do inside of a finishing tool path. And then we're going to do a step down here, okay? I'm going to go ahead and do a 50,000 step down. It takes a little bit longer to process. Anytime you add any extra features, it's one extra algorithm Masterham has to process. So you just have to you just wait a couple minutes for those uh, to go through. I'm going to go ahead and click OK here. It's going to let me know here. It says the tool path has been gouge checked. You will get this warning. It's just letting you know that you have done extra checks to either check for clearance, gouge, or tilt. Um, it's just a warning. Uh, it's not going to say that it's going to damage anything. It's just letting you know that you have it. I'm going to click that because I really don't care for the message to pop up on me. And then apply the tool path here. Looks normal. However, when we back plot it, we can see as we go down, it stays straight. Now you can see as the holder goes that it's actually tilting to avoid. Okay. Once it reaches an angle that it can cut it, it's going to stay at that angle up until it needs to change. So it should stay at that angle all the way to the bottom here. It's not going to tilt any further. You can see it stays at that same tilt all the way down. And again, it goes to the tool contact point, which is the side here, which is why we have extra cuts at the bottom, because it goes to the contact point, like any other 3D tool path. That's just kind of a stepping stone to the full multi-axis world, especially if you know the 3D tool path very, very well, and you just want to apply that in a multi-axis scenario where you can stub up the tool, choke it up, or have a little bit more rigidity for the cuts. Uh, do we have any additional questions on how to use that feature? Uh, again, it does require the multi-axis and a multi-axis machine to do that. Doesn't look like we have any additional questions here.
But that was all we had planned for today. Uh, hopefully you guys got something out of it. If you're interested in adding the multi-access package, even though you don't have five access machines, you can email us at sales at shoprink.com. Uh, if you already have the multi-access package, like people that were grandfathered back in the day, or you just have it and, you know, maybe you're using it on five access machines and haven't really thought to use it on your three axis, you know, we'd be happy to set up some custom training for you where Josh could come out and show you guys on your parts. If you guys are unsure if you could use it or not, you know, feel free to email us a file or get in touch with us and we can kind of see, okay, how, how can we apply some of this technology to what you guys are doing at your shop? Um, and I don't see any other questions popping up. One thing I did want to mention, you know, all you guys are on the webinar, so you got our email blast, but through the end of the month here, we're still running our referral program, which uh, basically if you fill out the form on our website, and people uh, end up purchasing something from us. You can win an iPad, which everyone loves to have an extra iPad laying around, but that does run through the end of this week. Um, other than that, uh, we'll hang out here for a few more minutes if anyone has any last minute questions. If you have a question that might be a little longer to solve, you know, shoot us an email and we'll be happy to help you today. Otherwise, I'm going to stop the recording, and remember, it will be on both our website and our YouTube page afterwards.